Volume ray marching, also known as volume ray tracing or volume ray casting, is a technique used in the procedural generation of computer graphics content. In shaders, we can use it for creating volumetric effects. Thus far, you've seen how we shade the outside geometry of a mesh using the vertices and associated pixels of the surfaces. However, we can also look beyond the physical makeup of a mesh and with a little math, turn it into something completely different and something that the camera can explore on the inside. What you are seeing now is the volumetric rendering of clouds, one of my favorite techniques, and although a little advanced, not beyond your shader programming abilities when you know how the algorithm works. In this lecture, we're going to look at the algorithm that makes all of this possible, ray marching. So we are already used to rendering every pixel and determining its color with our fragment vertex shaders. Now we are extending this idea to consider the distance and angle of the camera to a mathematically defined object that lives somewhere within the virtual space inside of a mesh. Here's a sphere being projected entirely with shader code inside a cube. Instead of seeing a cube, you see a 3D sphere. This sphere has absolutely no geometry. It is fully determined by a shader. The ray marching algorithm works within the fragment. For each pixel, a ray cast from the camera towards the pixel is made. We do this in a set number of steps of a predetermined size. If at any stage the end point of the ray is inside the volume we have defined, we say that we have hit the object and therefore we draw a pixel. If after the maximum number of steps the ray is not inside the volume, then that pixel is made some other color. In this example, pixels inside the volume have been colored red and the ones outside are fully transparent. The way in which the ray is stepped into the environment is known as marching. The ray scans across and marches towards each pixel over the surface between the vertices until the entire object has been rendered. Now remember that in a shader a pixel doesn't have a depth value, so we can't tell how far into the volume it is. Therefore, that is why we step towards it along the ray through the pixel until the 3D point at the end of the ray is inside a predetermined 3D volume. As far as the camera is concerned, all pixels are on a flat surface and therefore all the same relative distance from the camera allowing for a little parallax because of the perspective camera. To use ray marching, we need to know the following values. First, the camera's world position, which is conveniently defined in Unity's libraries as underscore world space camera pause. Then we need the world position of the pixel that will be defined by IWPOS and we will set that in the vertex function. Using these values we can determine the vector representing the ray which will be marched into the world and that's determined by IWPOS minus the world space camera position. To determine when the end point of the ray steps inside the sphere, in this case, the sphere needs defining with its center and radius. The hit point can then be considered the depth of the pixel, which gives the pixel a third dimension. So let's actually make this shader and create a virtual sphere that lives inside of a cube. The first thing you'll need is a cube. So this is a new empty Unity project and in the hierarchy, let's right click and add in a 3D object cube. So there's my cube there. Now I just want to zoom in a little bit over in the scene. And what we're going to do now is select the main camera in the hierarchy and just go game object align with view so that we can see it in here as well. You should see the same shader effect appear in both the scene and the game. Okay, so let's create our shader. So we're going to go into the assets and I'm just gonna put them all in the top directory here because there won't be a lot of files. We will create a shader and let's make it an unlit shader. We're going to strip most of this code out so it doesn't really matter which one you start with. Let's call it a primitive sphere. 
and we'll just double click. Open that up in Visual Studio or whatever your editor is that you're using. Now in here you'll see it's titled Unlit Primitive Sphere. The first thing I want to do at the top is just change this to Holistic so it will go underneath the Holistic directory where my other shaders that I've been creating are. All right, so let's go about editing this. First of all, we don't have any particular properties in this case. So let's just get rid of this main texture at the top. And in fact, we don't even need properties. If you want to come back later and add some properties, then you might want to leave that in there. But for this exercise, we won't bother. Now, instead of render type opaque up the top, let's just replace the tags and we will put in a Q. And we want that Q to be transparent because remember, we want to be able to show the sphere but block out the rest of the cube. So transparent like that. We're not particularly interested in level of detail. We're going to remove that. And instead here, we're going to do a blend so that we can blend any other objects that are behind this uh, sphere with it. So let's go uh, blend source alpha one minus source alpha. And this will be familiar from when we were blending things that have um, some opacity and some alpha values such as leaves with anything else that's in the environment. Okay, moving down, we're not using fog. So we'll just get rid of the make fog and the multi-compile fog. We will leave our Unity CG include file in there because it does contain that world camera pause for us. Okay, so we have um, by default our app data. It has our vertex position and also our UV, which we're not using in this case. Might come in handy if you want to put some textures on something. I'll leave that there. Let's move down to our um, structure for our vertex to frags. Now down in here, we're just going to make one little change, which is to get rid of our fog again. We don't want that to over complicate things. Now the float for in this case, which is entitled vertex, we're going to rename that as pause. So this is our position that we want. And for our texture cord here, we actually want to get rid of the UV and this will be our W pause or our world position. And we will make that a float three. So we have our position and our double W pause, which you'll see come into play in a moment. Now, as far as these textures go with main texture, we're not using that. So again, we can just delete all of that. And then we move on to our vertex function. So the vertex function is going to take our uh, O structure or create a O structure. And now the vertex in O, we've actually renamed that as pos. So pos will be the clip space position of our vertex world position. And we need this so that we can project our ray towards it. But first of all, what we need to do is create a W pos, which is our world position. So W pos. And then we're going to put equals and we'll get rid of this texture line that's already in here. We're going to put in, we want to multiply the unity object to world v dot vertex dot x, y, and z so that we get its position in there. Then again, get rid of our fog. Okay, so we now have our position and our world position. So it's the clip space position of the vertex and also the world position of the vertex um, by taking that vertex position, which will be in the local space of your cube and creating it as a world position for that vertex. Now, before we get on to the fragment method, we need to do our ray marching. We need to declare it because it needs to be called inside of the frag. Now, unlike C sharp code that you might be familiar with where you can put your methods anywhere, you've got to put your definitions for your functions before you actually use them in the shader. So in here, we will start adding in our 
code for our ray marching. So let's put in a couple of hash defines and we're going to have a hash define for steps and the number of steps will be 64. Now this is how many steps we take along the ray of a certain size before we kind of give up looking for a hit value. And the size of each of those steps we'll define here. If I can spell define properly for you. Define and that'll be step underscore size. And let's put that at 0 0.01. So it is actually quite a small step forward. Okay, let's first of all create the ray march hit. Uh, we'll come back and write another method above here in a moment. So this is going to return a float, which will be our depth that we've hit at. Let's call it ray march hit. And to that, we're going to pass a float three position, which is going to be the position of our pixel initially, and a float three direction. And the direction is the actual ray from the camera into that cube or 3D object that is holding onto this shader. Now the interior of this ray march is actually really quite simple. It's just a for loop and it's going to step along the ray. So it's going to be for int i equals zero and then we're going to have i is less than the number of steps that we want to take and then i plus plus and then within this for loop we're going to just increase the length of our ray. And what we're doing is we're taking our position and actually pushing it along the ray. So position plus equals direction multiplied by step size. Okay, so we start at the position of the pixel and we start stepping into the mesh. Now this is a little bit different from the original diagrams I showed you where we were stepping from the actual camera. Now you can do that, I guess, if you want to have your object appear or your rendered object appear in front of the mesh. That's okay. But in this case, we want our sphere to be inside of our cube. So therefore, we're going to start at the position of the pixel and start stepping in the direction of the ray each time. So the ray is going to be a little tiny ray which will be um, normalized so that's a length of one and therefore we can just keep stepping it forward along that. Okay and then at that point we're going to return zero down here if we've got to the end of that for loop and we haven't actually hit anything. So now we do need to test inside our for loop if we've hit something and return the depth instead. So just above where you've got your position, let's go if, and we're going to do declare this in a moment. So let's call it sphere hit. We're going to give it the position and we're going to define our sphere. So the sphere we want to be at zero, zero, zero. So this is the center of our sphere and this zero, zero, zero is relative to the mesh that it is inhabiting. So in the center of that cube, and then we send it through the radius and let's put 0 0.5. Now, if the call to this method returns true, then we've actually hit the sphere. And in that case, we will return position because that will be the depth at which we've hit. So let's have a look at what this sphere hit looks like. So above here, we'll just return a bool from it and we'll put in sphere hit and it's going to be float three P, which is our pixel position, float three center that we're passing through and float radius. Okay, so inside of here, we want to test if our position is inside of the radius. So when is a point inside of a sphere? Well, if the distance between the point and the center of your sphere is less than the radius, then that point must be inside of the sphere. So we're going to return distance P to the center. And if that happens to be less than the radius, it's got to be inside of your sphere. 
So this is your hit condition, which is really elegant and really simple. And a sphere is in fact probably the most simplest 3D object that you can determine whether you are inside of or not because it's just such a simple shape. It's got a center and it has a radius that defines it. Okay, so that's it. That is your ray marching and it's really quite straightforward. So if you've ever heard about the term ray marching before, you might have thought, oh, it's really complex, but it's not. It's quite logical and elementary. You're just stepping along a ray or marching along a ray towards a position. Now let's go ahead and use this down in our frag to get our color. So the first thing that we're going to do is delete everything that comes with our default frag. And we're going to create our view direction or what is our ray. So float three view direction, which is going to equal normalized version. So normalize and it will be I dot W pause minus the world space camera pause. Then we will get our float three for our world position. I'm probably just over declaring stuff here, but that's just so that you can see it. So here's our world position of our pixel and that will be I dot W pause. Now our float depth of this particular pixel will be what is returned from our ray march. So that equals ray march hit when we pass through the world position and the view direction. Then remember from up here where we've got our ray march hit, if we return zero, then we actually haven't hit anything and we want to do a transparent pixel. If it returns something else, then we want to uh, get a red pixel. So in here we put if depth does not equal zero, then we will return a fixed four, which will be one, zero, zero, one. So a fully opaque red pixel. Else we will return a fixed four. And it actually doesn't matter what color it is because it's going to be fully transparent with a zero on the end there for the alpha value and in this case I've just defined it to be fully white. Okay so we're ready to try this out. So save that. Now we're going to go back into Unity and before you continue I've got a really small typo in my ray march where that should have been a float three because it's going through. Good if you pick that up as we were typing it. Okay save that now. Let's go back into Unity and we're ready to apply it to our cube. So back in your project where you've got your shader, just right click, create a material. And then with that material, it doesn't really matter what you call it, just to call it red sphere. And over in the inspector, you want to change the shader, drop that down. And we're looking for, in this case, holistic and then primitive sphere. Drag and drop that onto your cube and it will immediately turn into a sphere. Now, if you turn around like this and move the camera around, you'll see that you've got a fully fledged sphere, which is flat shaded. That's okay. All right, so that is the basics of ray marching and actually creating a volume within a mesh, or it really should be called a virtual volume because it's not actually there. It has no geometry, it has no collider, it's just rendered as a sphere. In the next lecture, we'll come back and have a look at some of the issues that you're going to face as you make your cube bigger and still expect a sphere to appear in the middle of it, as well as some different definitions of volumes that you can put inside. Thanks for watching. Please support the development of more superb online learning content by subscribing. And as always, visit holistic3d.com to learn more about awesome games development books and tutorials.